Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuelli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And today we are, once again, very fortunate to have uh, as our guest, um, Professor Jean Brigmont, um, who has been on The Gaggle before. He's, of course, a, a renowned um, physicist and, more, more important uh, from our perspective, uh, a geopolitical analyst. And... Um, since we last spoke, Jean, um, you know, the uh, crisis has continued to um, unfold. And a topic we wrestled with last time, and we've been wrestling uh, for months now, uh, is um, the strange absence of Europe on the political scene. Um, why Europe has uh, been unable in any way to exert its own national interest, its own geopolitical interest. And instead, it has been uh, content to be an appendage of the United States. And it just seems very, very strange, you know, given that there have been, you know, yeah. prominent European leaders in the past who have asserted European interests, who have um, criticized American foreign policy, but that, uh, and, you know, insisted on pursuing their own agenda, but that's absent. And, uh, and it's just very strange. It's strange to us, and it's strange to many people around the world. So, Jean, what, what are your thoughts on the matter? Okay. Well, I think it's a combination of, you know, Americanization and the, the myth of the European construction. Let me remind you of something which you may know or may not know. On June the 6th, 1964, there was the 200th anniversary of the landing in Normandy. And the Gaulle absolutely refused to participate in the celebration. He was under pressure to do so from all his allies. And he said, no, no, no. Because he said, this landing was the beginning. The Americans were intending to occupy Europe. And I'm not going to participate in that. In fact, you could say the same thing happened in the East. OK, it doesn't mean that you are not happy that they were got rid of the of the Germans, but of course, the same thing happened in Eastern Europe, but then after that, it was sort of occupied or dominated by the Soviet Union, as you know, in Hungary. And, 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 and of course, in Western Europe, it was softer, but nevertheless, there was a colonization of the mines, and uh, the goal was describing it very well. He said, the way you corrupt the Americans corrupt people, they send you a box of... Uh, whiskey bottles, they invite you to dinner in Paris, or they invite you to a seminar, a semester in American universities. And that's the way the intellectual class and the journalist and the political class and so on, we all became American. On September, after September 11, the moon, you know, had a headline, we are all Americans, and we are, in a sense, all Americans. I've been myself in the United States, I worked there, I was very well treated, that's not the issue. But I can see their aspiration, especially among liberals, even more than among conservatives, to world domination, and I don't like it. And I don't like it when it comes to the non-European world and even also about Europe. And that's something the goal was aware of, and the goal was also opposed to the European Union, at least the way it was constructed, <laughs> because if you give all the power to an unelected uh, bureaucracy, which is what the European is, then what are you going to obtain? You are going to obtain people who have no legitimacy. As I always say, they have no legitimacy in popular vote or uh, being uh, whatever. I mean, von der Leyen is just a complete zero and she has an absolute power in Eastern, in Western Europe and she makes any decision she wants. She decided to take sanctions against uh, Russia. She decided to send money to Ukraine. Who decided that? Of course, you can, they say, oh, but it's ratified by the nation state. Yeah, but the state, once the decision is made, aren't really free to say no. So uh, that's the way it works. And Michel, who is Belgian, I know him. He, he was prime minister. I mean, he's a pale figure. And he, he, I mean, I don't think he goes along with von der Leyen so much. But you see, these people are naked. So what are they going to do? They have to legitimize themselves. And therefore, they are open to every conceivable pressure from the powers that be. And, and that's the whole source of our tragedy. Another source, which I think is ideological, is that there's a big change in the lessons that people drew from World War II. De Gaulle and Mitterrand are typical examples of that. They both, of course, lived through World War II, even though, of course, Mitterrand was much younger. 
and he was slightly involved in the collaboration, but that, that's not the main point. I think that's not the main point. The point is that the goal through the conclusion that we need a France which is independent, strong, and a factor of stability uh, in the world, which basically he did more or less do that. I think he was too he was more anti-Soviet than he had to be, but at least he was a factor of stability. Mitterrand and the 68 generation took the completely opposite viewpoint. The, Mitterrand said nationalism is war. In fact, they all took the decision, the idea that the source of the wars and everything in the 20th century is not capitalism or imperialism, as uh, even Marxists don't say that, they say it's nationalism, it's a sentiment, mm -hmm. it's racism. Okay, it's an attachment to the nation state. So we have to dismantle the nation state and everything has been done to dismantle it, either integration with NATO, remember that when, or you may not know that, but when the goal wanted to go out of NATO, Mitterrand was in the opposition, was against that. He was against that. He was already Atlanticist to that point, you see. And of course, he was Atlanticist later during the first Gulf War and so on. But he, so that's, and of course, uh, you've seen with his successor Hollande, how he, he dealt with the Minsk agreement, etc. But so, you know, there was this one thing is NATO and alignment of the United States. The other thing is the European construction. Since nationalism is war, we must get rid of the nation state and create a European nation state, which I never understand how it's going to work because no, people don't have the same history, the same language and everything. So it's not at all like the 13 states of the United States at the beginning. And then there is also the idea of favoring region, everything that's regional, okay? All the local customs, all the local languages, those that, that more or less disappeared have to be revived and uh, cultivated and so on to uh, divide the nation even more. And then, of course, last but not least, there is immigration. Okay, all the discourse, oh, immigration is such a chance for France. Well, <laughs> chance, it depends where you may be in soccer, but, <laughs> you know, it depends on ups and downs. And, 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 of course, it's been totally unilateral. And, of course, now you have a large fraction of the population, and we see it in Belgium also, which have no sense of belonging to the same community, you see. During New Year's Eve, there were people who were uh, trying to rescue a woman who had fallen from uh, f the fourth floor of, uh, of a building in Brussels, and they were attacked by youth, the neighborhood, with bottles and with uh, firecrackers and so on. Uh, even, uh, you know, uh, nurses. I mean, it just makes no sense. Even when there was, a, you know, anarchists and when there were a much more radical leftist movement, they never did something like that, not attacking nurses, okay, policemen maybe, or heads of state and so on. But so, I mean, it seems to me that there is this intense decoupling between part of, part, of course, only part, I think a minority, but still part of the migrant population and the general population. And of course, that further de divides the population and weakens the nation state. So everything has been done to destroy the nation state. And I think there is no hope if we don't rebuild some sort of, you know, belonging, which of course goes through, I mean, we are never going to, the French are never going to feel being German, okay? When you look at the World Cup or vice versa, right? when you, the World Cup is the best example. I mean, how many French were supporting the Argentinian team or how many French were supporting the German team? I mean, maybe 10 somewhere in a anarchist cafe, but nothing, Nothing more, okay? So the, the vast majority of people are identifying with their nation. So that's unfortunately if one wants, but that's human nature. And and, and uh, the problem is that if you then decouple the democracy and the institution and so on, the, the, the deciding make, making process from the nation state as we do in the European Union, and as we do in dividing the people in every possible way. Well, I, I think George and I uniformly agree with you, but it seems to me that... <clears throat> Uh, jettisoning the nation state and um, uh, um, basically um, uh, assigning the word nationalism into some kind of uh, slur, uh, negative connotation. You you could get you could get away with it. We've watched it in our lifetime, okay. But there was always the other side of the coin: is that prosperity and security. And as long as you had prosperity and security, I think you could get people to kind of go, well, okay, I'll go along with it, okay? Grudgingly, uh, countries like uh, Hungary and Poland to a different degree. Um, but when you, when, when you 
when security and prosperity put in check. Because if you the outside world, when they look at Europe, you know, in the in the post-war era, they don't think of Germans, they don't think of French, they don't think of Italians. They may think of Italian and French and German things, but they don't think of German idea or Italian idea. They think that's rich. They're rich people. Okay. Now that's all being put on the line right now. Okay. Yeah. Because you could get away with all these things. I re I remember I was living in Poland and they were going into the EU and I kept telling them, you're going to regret this. You're going to regret this. Okay. Because you fought the Austrians, the Germans and the Russians, and the Hungary, everybody to get your independence. And now you're going to sign it away. OK, and I, I think I'm being proven correctly because of their uh, very rocky attitude uh, with Brussels. So the the only way that I would say to main, to go back to this um, vision of Europe as being safe and as being prosperous, you, you this uh, this neoliberal ideology has reached its limits, because yeah. when when you start getting poor and you're, you, you sense your place in the in the cosmos is diminishing, Yes. There has to be something has to give. Now, as I think all three of us know, you know that neoliberalism is a very potent force. It's extremely in, uh, uh, intolerant, and it will vanquish anyone that gets in its way. So, you know, we started out um, before we started recording Happy New Year, but it's not going to be a Happy New Year. No, that's true. But of course, the problem is always what you mean by rich. I mean, when I was young, I, I knew that we were richer than India, but that you compare yourself to your whole past, not necessarily to people on the other side of the world. So the point is that the question is indeed how, I mean, we are still richer, France is still richer than maybe even Hungary or Poland or many other countries, but they, they, it's always relative to what they used to be. I mean, if the uh, baker cannot pay his electricity bill, then that's what he's looking at is, you know, he's not looking at whether the fact that maybe uh, energy is lacking in India. I mean, that's not this problem. Okay, so it's, it's uh, in that sense. I mean, of course, the yeah, and the security. I mean, we are not getting more secure huh, internally. Certainly, I mean, that's certainly the case. There is no, there is no. I mean, there is uh, the. It's sort of hidden, but there is a certain a fair amount of crime and uh, insecurity and so on. Well, we, we, if I could interject here, um, George and I were quite. Um, uh, um, uh, we found it quite whimsical, this whole um, regime change um, um, uh, conspiracy in Germany, which is kind of dropped out of the media here. But it seems that the, the authorities are hyper alert, hyper afraid of, of, of their, the stability of their power. Um, and, and, and again, like I said, this level of intolerance, I mean, this whole German conspiracy thing came, it seemed like it came out of a comic book. But, hmm. but George, it was like 28, 38 police officers per person that they believe was involved in this. I mean, that's a pretty gross overreaction here. Yeah, so well, that, yeah, that, they, well, that was their, sort their of similar. Their stability yeah, that, that, yeah, isn't so, as great as they think. They're afraid. I'm sorry, George. Right. right. No, I think I think that's right. But I think it goes back to um, to, to your point, John, that um, the more you kind of uh, centralize power at the top, uh, the more the anarchy there is at the bottom. So, in other words, the, there isn't the, the 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 power has been taken away from the local authorities and has now been, um, you know, essentially ascribed to the, the powers that are actually unaccountable. I and mean, it's like you know the the people the, the people who run the EU are not accountable to anyone else. So, but that's you know that's where the the the, the power has kind of uh, dissipated and hence you know there's so much crime that's now you know manifest everywhere yeah yeah that's true i mean i don't know how it's going to turn out because uh, you know it's not how it's not easy to get out of the european union it's not easy to do anything within it so i don't know how that's going to evolve i mean it depends on the evolution of the war in ukraine in the end okay i mean because everything uh, I mean, the, the powers that be in Europe still hope for a Ukrainian victory, which I don't believe in, but there could be a stalemate. And then, of course, a stalemate, then, uh, you know, people will still hope to win on both sides. I don't know. I mean, I, people have been predicting a, a massive Russian offensive in the winter, but I've not seen it yet, so we'll see. Right. But know. one thing you were just saying about the, the nationalism, um, yeah, they're very hostile to nationalism, but it's also very selective 
as to which nationalism oh, yeah. they're hostile to. Because, for instance, I mean, if you go back to the, the wars of the 1990s, all the hatred was directed toward the Serbs. The Serbs were uniquely nationalistic, yet clearly the nationalists were, you know, the Croats. The Croats were vastly more nationalist. They explicitly set up their state as a nation state of the Croats, which the Serbs did not do. But so, and again, same with Russia and Ukraine. You know, everyone's, you know, they, they're waving the Ukrainian flag around, Ukraine this, Ukraine that, uh, but they hate Russian nationalism. So it's kind of very selective when they say, well, nationalism is the cause of all wars. Well, certain nationalism. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But in France, they use it against French, what they call French nationalism. That's what the, the nation state. But I agree with you that it's very selective when it comes to foreign policy. It's related, of course, to certain American views or Israeli views that are favoring certain uh, certain nation as opposed to others. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, the Albanians, for example, the Kosovo were extremely nationalist. I've known some indirect and they're extremely nationalist, but that nationalism is okay. And the Ukrainians are uh, fascistically nationalist. But uh, I mean, it's almost a joke that in France you sue somebody uh, some humorist who makes a joke about the Jews who is politi politically incorrect, and then he's sued, and then they give weapons to people who honor Bandera. It's very fun. I mean, it's, if it wasn't tragic, it would be very funny. It's completely ridiculous, but that's the way it is now. No. It's not. It's not dissimilar to. Sorry, Peter. Just just to make that. Just to follow up on that. Uh, it's not dissimilar to the way the Soviet Union was conceived, because the Soviet mm. Union was conceived as mm. very hostile to Russian nationalism. Russian nationalism was a terrible thing. That's greater Russian chauvinism, that's oppressive and everything else. So the Bolsheviks promoted every other nationalism. You know, that, that, that was good because they were the oppressed nations uh, mm. resisting Russia. And the Rus and the Bolsheviks also promoted regionalism. You know, every, you know, every, oh, well, this is good, this is regionalism here. Well, this is a language, oh, that, let's promote this language. Or, you know, let, let's promote, so <laughs> they, they thought that that's the way they're gonna keep control of everything by having everyone uh, divided against everyone else. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I think it's more or less the way it was. Yeah, people uh, think, that, I mean, there was the same thing in Yugoslavia because there was, opposition to create Serbian nationalism, supposedly, yes. Yeah, that's true. But uh, as I say, I mean, I, I was looking at it more from the point of view of what's going on in Western Europe. I mean, there is a lot of French resentment against Germany and they think Germany controls the European Union, but I don't think that's quite true because Germany is still an occupied territory and in their minds are very, very American. They are very submissive to their Western uh, victors. And so, for me, the influence of the United States is really the, the dominant question. Well, I mean, glad you brought that up because it, it goes right to what I was about to ask you here. Um, over the last few news cycles, we have the former French president, Francois Hollande, uh, come out and essentially confirm what um, uh, Angela Merkel said to the German media a couple of weeks ago. Um, George and I discussed it at great length even yesterday. Um, and we were willing, at least I was more than less willing uh, to uh, accept that Frau Merkel is just playing to the current narrative, okay? And mm -hmm. you know, and, and the hell with with the historical record. But when Hollande comes out and basically says, "Yeah, yeah, we weren't um, being honest; we were being duplicitous." Um, so we have, you know, uh, 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 when Angela Merkel was leaving power, she was on the cover of every single magazine. She was lauded in the America. You know, when Trump was elected, she's now the leader of the free world. You know, she was a person of consequence, if you like her or not. OK. And there were a lot of consequences, I say. Um, but Hollande comes out and says this here. So what does this tell us about the is this because of just uh, submission to the United States? Because we knew that the U.S., not part of the Minsk process, but they were dismissive of it all along, uh, dismissive of the Normandy format. And um, and now they come out and come clean, as we say in American English. That doesn't, um, um, uh, for, uh, that's an ill boding for how this conflict in Ukraine is going to end eventually, because the Russians are gonna say, but you admitted you were lying to us for eight years, I mean, what are we supposed to do? I mean, I think that, you know, these the, the, these revelations have created a real dilemma because mm -hmm. the Russians were always saying, but you won't keep your promise. Well, Hollande and Merkel came out and said, yeah, we didn't. 
Yeah, well, Mer you know, you probably know Merkel is at the Duran, and he he was not convinced by Merkel's statement. He thought Merkel was saying that because she didn't want to look to have been pro-Russian in the past, but he thinks that at the time of the Minsk agreement, she was sincerely in favor of it. Now, Hollande is a different character. I just I, I'd like to point out that that was the original position of the Moon of Alabama that other people have re repeated. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, okay, but. It's possible. I mean, the Moon of Alabama is German, so he knows Germans. And I haven't read the German statement, but the I I think Hollande is different. Okay, Hollande is much, you know, less important character than Merkel, and he he may. But, say, but, but if I could just interject, these were the two leaders. Well, Sarkozy, but these were the two countries that signed on to it. So it does have significance here. Okay. As a signet, as a guarantor of an internationally recognized United Nations recognized process, so I even though if he's the um, playing second fiddle to Merkel, it still counts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I am a hundred and two hundred percent behind the Russia. If they think that the words of the Western leaders are not to be trusted anymore, that's I completely agree. And even if Merkel was sort of you know not really following the historical record, uh, Putin is completely right to be upset and to think that he's been cheated because that's more or less the, what she, the impression she gives. But Hollande may be more sincere in the fact that he always cheated the Russians because Hollande, Hollande I think was, uh, I think not, if not Hollande, some other people from the Socialist Party went to apologize uh, at the time of the Gulf War, the second Gulf War to the American embassy because uh, of the opposition of Chirac against the war. So their uh, level of uh, Atlanticism, which is just beyond belief. And they've always been like that. And they they, they were, pro I mean, the goal stopped their program of uh, giving nuclear weapons to Israel. I mean, they, they've been, uh, in foreign policy, the French socialists, not everywhere, for example, in, in Sweden, you know, with Palm, it was different, but but in and even in Belgium, it's a bit different. But in 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 France, they've been absolutely horrible. And so, Hollande is, of course, of that generation, and is that gang. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was, you know, duplicious at that time. Merkel, I don't know. But anyway, the fact is that given those statements, the Russian are hundred percent right in saying that they they were being taken for a ride and now they're not going to trust anybody. But of course, that doesn't bode well for how the conflict is going to end because, you know, if there is an overwhelming military victory from the Russians, but that's not in the cast now, I don't know, I don't know the military situation, then of course things will be solved. But uh, we don't know because they can still send the NATO troops, Polish troops, Romanian troops, I don't know. They can put more cannon fodder on the on, on the ground and uh, we, I mean, in military affairs, I'm just totally, uh, you know, suspending my judgment. But that may be, that may be one reason why both Hollande and Merkel are now saying this, because after all, they know how the Russians would respond to these comments. The Russians would say, well, why, why are we going to bother talking to them? And, but that's also the American position because the Americans don't want, they don't want any negotiations. They don't want peace. They want this war to go on. I mean, that's that. You know, it, it works for Americans at every level. So they want this to go on. So it's like you know, you know, it, it's very odd that they both come out at the same time. And you can say, yeah. well, yeah, who, whose agenda does this serve? It serves the Americans' agenda, as as most yeah. things that coming out of Europe does. Yeah, Hollande, of course, Hollande was uh, totally committed to. Uh... I mean, he does say that the only solution is that the Russians would lose. I mean, I don't know if Merkel said that, but he says the only outcome of the of the war. So they're all committed to an, you know, never-ending war. On the other hand, you know, defeating. I mean, the problem is really the idea of stalemate because the defeating the Russians, that's not going to be easy to put it mildly. But for the Russians to win overwhelmingly against all the forces, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, they are grinding down the Ukrainian, but then the Ukrainians can bring in more. You can bring more NATO troops. I don't know how the, how long it's going to last. I, I just don't know. It looks like a stalemate for the moment. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I have to push the back. Position, the, I position have to push back the, so the position of the European is absurd because they're uh, shooting themselves in the foot about the energy. And then uh, they're going to support a war which is not in their interest, which is only a proxy war of the Americans, which is unbelievable. I was looking this morning at a video about how much you know, penalties the Americans have imposed on European companies because of so-called corruption violation of uh, trade embargoes, et cetera, with Iran, Cuba, and so on. I mean, it's unbelievable. How do we let ourselves be, you know, taxed like that? 
And there is no reaction either from the national and uh, uh, national authorities or even more so from the European in, uh, in, uh, the European authorities. But uh, as I say, they're all Americanized. So it's very, it's, the, it's depressing. It's depressing to look at the news because you look at all these experts on the news. First of all, they always, every other day, they say, ah, oh, the Russians are out of munition. And then there's a new bombing. Then they say, well, but now they're really out of munition. <laughs> they keep on going. Do you, like that. Do you believe? Do you, I mean, I, you've said something I think it, it kind of surprises me a little bit, to be honest with you. Do, do you do you think the French military wants to get into a ground war? And, and ah, in no, 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 no. I didn't say that. I said that they could send Polish or Romanian troops. I didn't say this. Would but, French. But they're still NATO countries. From Russia's perspective, it's sure, NATO. Sure, sure, sure. But, the, but I don't think the French military, but you see, even the Pentagon may be more... Uh, prudent than the State Department. I mean, they, you know very well that these are not always the same. And I think the French military, except some people who may be very, uh, you know, there are all these generals who come on TV and they always say, ah, but the Ukrainians are winning, etc. But I don't think they want to be involved at all. But the, and I'm not even sure what Macron wants, but, you know, how could he do anything else given the media? I mean, the the power of the media over the politicians should not be underestimated because if all the media turn against a politician, then he's dead. So, uh, and all the media are, you know, on the Atlanticist line, except some far right, so called far right move, uh, media, which are really marginal. And then uh, that's the way the situation is. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know the French military, but I doubt that they are very gung ho about this war. In fact, the, the capitalists, I mean, that's what I found always remarkable is the European capitalists, many of them are not uh, going to about this sanction zone because they realize that it's being they're being ruined. But, you know, the ideology, I always say the ideology actually in many situations, especially in wars, come, takes precedence over economic interest. People, especially Marxists, think that economic interests are you know, leading to war. But in fact, if people are really rational about their economic interests, they wouldn't go into this war. But there is ideology, there is all this anti-Russian sort of Kazai religion. And then, of course, that leads to uh, this domination by the ideology. I always give the example of expression, I don't know if you use it in English, going to Canossa. Uh, that was at a time when the emperor of Germany had to go to a place to apologize to the Pope. And the mm -hmm. German emperor certainly had more military power than the Pope, but the ideological power of the church was so strong that he had to apologize. And I think that's the way it goes even now. It doesn't change that much. And, and the ideology, the anti-Russian, uh, so-called democracy, democratic values, I mean, to say that the Ukrainians <laughs> share our values, this is the ultimate absurdity, but nevertheless, it's one of the dogmas uh, of, of our time. But this is the interesting thing. Um, you, you have these strange politicians who kind of emerge out of nowhere, like this, This the, we're always having a laugh, Peter and I, about this Finnish prime minister. We don't know her name. You know, the, the <laughs> work hard, party hard girl. No, no, we, no. Call, we call her Finn chick. The Finn okay. chick. Um, you know, she comes out of nowhere, very young, kind of attractive. She's the prime minister. She, she makes this decision, a, a major decision um, oh. to, to lead Finland into NATO, you know, border now the you know 800 mile border becomes a border between NATO and Russia, and she does it. You know, she just you know goes off and then parties and then you know say no no referendum, and everybody says go that, that's it we'll have no referendum on the matter. So it's a it's kind of strange. There are so many of these political figures who come out of nowhere, and uh, and they're, and they're making you know, major decisions, you know, Annalena Baerbock, you know, she's another one, or, you know, these, um, you know, the various uh, chicks who are, who are in the Baltic states. I mean, it's, you know, we, we, we don't really have politicians anymore who kind of, you know, you know, punch their ticket and, you know, you know, move up within the ranks. They just emerge out of nowhere and then make these massively significant uh, decisions. Yeah, I know. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I, I... I, I've been working in Finland very often and I really, I could see that there was, of course, a resentment towards Russians. In fact, I think in the Baltic state, Hungary, Poland, uh, Romania, probably, I don't know, hold the, I mean, at least in, in, in the past that used to be part of the Russian empire, uh, there is an enormous hatred for Russians, but which is not uh, decoupled, let's put it like that, 
from racist content for uh, the supposedly Asiatic hordes that the Russians are supposed to be. And of course, that transplant in the United States. And in the United States, if you put together all the Baltics, the Poles, the Jews, all the people who emigrated from the Russian Empire and the Russians, that's a large contingent of people. And some of them are very influential on foreign policy, like uh, Newland and uh, Rusband and so on. I mean, these people are very influential. And uh, again, the ideology is so that you can't really uh, denounce them. And then uh, that has a lot of weight. I mean, for example, one, one the foreign policy one... establishment, the foreign policy establishment at the time of the recognition, the expansion to its world of NATO, the real establishment was not in favor of that. And Clinton did it partly to satisfy voters from these states, these uh, immigrants from uh, mm -hmm. the Eastern Europe. It wasn't really something, I mean, the, the people who are really responsible statescraft, I would say state, state uh, men, they, they were against that. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't that work in the case of Israel? I mean, the, most of them come from the Soviet Union. Why don't they hate the Russians? They have they? Israel has good relations with Russia. You know, a lot of a lot of Russian Jews are very uh, very attached to Russia. Have remained very attached to Russia. Why is it? Why is it that only when they come to the United States they suddenly absorb this intense loathing for Russia? They're not necessarily the same, huh? and they're not. I don't know. You have to. One has to study the immigration to Israel and study the, you see, the Soviet Union after all defeated Nazi Germany. So those who, after the war, there were lots of Jews who were very pro-Soviet in the communist movement, et cetera, and even very Stalinist. So uh, there is a different, there is a question of what part of history you remember. If you remember the pogroms or, or if you are uh, hostile to the resurrection of traditional Russia and Orthodox Church, etc., in Russia, then of course you are going to hate the Russians. I think there is, I see it around myself in Belgium and France. I mean, I see an intense hatred for Russia, which has nothing to do, which is not really justifiable in terms of political. I mean, historical. Among, among, among descendants of Jewish immigrants, okay? And of course in, in the US even more. In Israel, I don't know, but Israel is, it's a complicated thing because. You see, Israel has a strange diplomacy. On the one, on the one hand, they don't care about international law, respect for their neighbor, etc. But on the other hand, they want to have good relations with people far away, including Russia, China, the United States, etc., because they feel that they have to be protected, mostly with the United States. But of course, there they have a huge lobby to, you know, push in that direction. Of course, also in Europe. So it's a very special case. It would take hours and to really. Well, I mean, I, I, it also I mean, it's something that. George and I have talked about uh, uh, at length is that, you know, when, when you just mentioned the lobby, um, well, most of that lobby are American Christian Zionists. Okay. I mean, so it's yeah. very ideological. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, that's a cover. They wouldn't exist without the Israeli pro-Israel lobby. The pro-Israel lobby. Oh, it's a, it's a it's a perfect relationship. It, it really is a perfect relationship for them. Yeah, but I don't think it's really perfect. From I mean, I'm not Christian, but I think from a Christian point of view, it doesn't make much sense. And I think it is sort of these people are sort of manipulated by the others. I mean, they are sort of, and and if you really look at who is in that so-called Christian lobby. It's not that Christian, and and it's so really. I've come across a lot of evangelical American Christians that just are fanatical about Israel. Okay, oh, yeah, and, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, and they yeah. didn't need a whole lot of influencing. Okay, I mean yeah, it's, that's scripture, true. That's true. it's scripture to them. It, it, it's it's it, and it's the it's it, it's part of their um, world view. Okay, certain, so it, it, work, it works very well for both. It's certainly a certain view of the scriptures. You can have. Certainly, there are other Christians who have other views of the Christian. The Catholics don't have that view of the Christian scripture. Well, I mean, if 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 you want to be uh, um, focused strictly on scripture, the Jews don't do very well in it at the end. Okay, and I've always found that to be very very interesting. Okay, but I, I want to ask you. We talk a little bit about uh, NATO uh, before. It seems to me, and this is my own personal opinion, and George and I have um, uh, discussed and even argued about it uh, over the last ten months. But one of the, it, 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 since Russia's goal in all of this stated uh, in December um, uh, 17th in uh, uh, 2021, 
um, that Russia had found the pan-European security architecture intolerable and that it would react to um, influence that then the status quo. Well, obviously it has done that with February 24th of last year. That's a long introduction to what, what Russia wants to resolve is its NATO problem. And I think that it, it is all encompassing. And I think it also explains their approach to fighting this conflict because historically speaking, Russia has, has always a lot of men, a lot of tanks, a lot of hardware, and they just plow their way through, okay? We saw that with the Red Army uh, just destroying the Wehrmacht. Even as, um, or, uh, as late as 2008 in August, and um, uh, their military operation against Georgia through South Ossetia. Same thing, you know, just, you know, just roll across. This time it's very, very different, very different. And what George, and I think George is probably the first person to say it, is that one of the, the, the one of the reasons, probably the primary reason Russia is taking this approach is that it, it it's not fighting a conflict, uh, not only only against Ukraine, but all of NATO. And so there has to be a resolution to Na the NATO problem for the Russians. Yeah, they fight, they fight, I mean, a much bigger force than uh, when they were in, in Georgia. Of course, not as, as strong as World War II, but in World War II, they had enormous amount of sacrifice. I'm not sure they could be able to make, they would be able to make such sacrifices now. But to come back to your remark about the evangelicals, there is a little anecdote which I should mention. Is Wolfowitz, who was one of the main architects of the yeah. Iraq war, somebody asked him, you know, what do you think of these uh, uh, evangelicals who think that the, the Jews will, uh, I don't know, uh, not be saved at the last day or something like that, or they will have to convert to, to Christianity or else they go to hell, etc. Then he replied, and were nevertheless pro Israel, and he replied, Yes, it's their theology, but it's our Israel. So that's yeah. I, think. I, I think I think that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah I, th I think that's right, Jean, because you know the, the the point of the evangelicals is that they are a kind of an alibi. So you can yeah. attack the Israel lobby, and then you say, "Hey, I'm not attacking the Jews. I'm just attacking yeah. the Christian evangelicals." I mean, you know, there's a, you can see on YouTube there's a debate with Noam Chomsky. Now, Chomsky has always been very critical of Israel, and then, and he talks about the influence on American public life. And then when he's asked, "Well, who's doing this influencing?" Oh, it's the evangelical, because yes. he doesn't want to say, "Yeah, it's the Jews." Know, so, know, so there is that, that always that aspect that. You know, you know, well, and I like him in many ways, but I don't agree with him at all about that. Yes, that's true. The Jew, the the Christians are sort of uh, yeah. They are a punching ball. But uh, to come back to the military situation, well, the point is that it seems to, I mean, I, I've i been listening to, you know, people saying, oh, but now the, the Ukrainians send their last forces in Bakhmut, etc. But then they keep on sending more forces. I don't know how it's going to turn out. How, I don't know where they find the forces, but obviously NATO has committed, I mean, is the US has committed itself to uh, support Ukraine. In, you know, to that to fight to the last Ukrainians against the Russians, and of course that's a problem for the Russians. I, I just I'm not a military person, as Merko used to say, and I really don't know how that's going to turn out. But uh, uh, the situation is really uh, worrisome in the sense that we are uh, looking for a prolonged conflict and a war of attrition and all these things, and it's really awful. I think the Everybody should sit down and negotiate, but uh, the Ukrainians are still saying. Well, that I'm, I'm sorry. The Ukrainians I'm, I'm saying sorry. they're going to get back. Uh, Crimea. Sit down and negotiate. I mean, we just talked about Holland and and Merkel. I mean, that's why I brought it up. Okay. Yeah. So no, no. What, what 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 initiative? What, what, what why would Russia even consider that? Okay. Yeah, and again, I want to stress my point and my question here is that there has to be as definitive as possible resolution to this, or else it'll happen again in five years. I mean, if, if there is a ceasefire, okay, uh, uh, like, like we have on the Korean Peninsula, okay, I mean, the, 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 Ukraine will just be turned into a NATO outpost, okay, and and, and Russia will find that intolerable. It, in, it, it found what was happening before February 24th as intolerable. So I don't know why people are talking about a ceasefire and negotiated end. There's only, from Russia's perspective, there's only one negotiation, surrender. Yeah, if they can implement that. When I say they should oh, be- 
when yeah. they discuss when they say they should discuss when I say they should discuss, I mean the Ukrainians should discuss and concede some of the territories, but they should have done it before. They should have uh, given autonomy to the Donbass and so on. I mean, the Ukrainians have been pushed by the West to be totally irresponsible, and then uh, uh, we are in this conflict. I agree that there is no uh, possibility of negotiation now with the Germans and the French or with the Americans. So, but okay, you say. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I am just waiting and every day I look at the news, but uh, you know very well that the front line doesn't move very much, so we have to wait and see. It moves yeah. a little bit, but not much. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so. And I think that, you know, where Peter and I have had some disagreements is that I, I don't quite see that sort of model that, well, you know, the, this is what the Red Army did. They just sent in there and they, they just crushed the, the Wehrmacht. I just, I, I personally don't see Russia as the same country. It's not the, it's not the, well, the Soviet Union of 1945. I mean, we're agreeing with each other. I'm just trying to flesh out that this they're fighting a very different conflict than what we traditionally expected from the Russians. And that's what's created so much of our our discussion uh, on a daily weekly basis because it is very different okay and the the another thing i like to stress is that you know with the the, the destruction of uh, ukrainian infrastructure particularly energy what 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 is happening and it doesn't get the same kind of headlines um but it, what's happening is ukraine is turning into a failed state and it may, may be, end up being a fail, failed state with a standing military, which is kind of odd, okay? Because that military is not going to be supported by the Ukrainian state, but by NATO powers. So this is, we're getting into a situation where we have a completely dysfunctional state and you have an army that is being, um, because I think as Scott Ritter put it to us a few weeks ago, is that the Ukrainian army was defeated last summer, okay? Now Russia is fighting NATO with Ukrainian troops. So I think that the, the, the there's this impatience. And I, with like the, the two of you, I would like to see this come to an end immediately. I don't want to see any more death and destruction. But given the hand that we're all looking at right now is mm -hmm. that Russia's um, plan, as I see it, is basically to turn Ukraine into a failed state where then it's military operation. Because whatever area it's going to liberate, the, the 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 people on the ground have to believe. I'm going to plagiarize from George again. They're going to have to believe that the Russians are going to stay, and yeah. and that is very unclear. Yeah, of course. I mean, the fact that they withdrew from uh, Kherson city is not a good sign. People may not trust them. So I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, it all depends on the evolution of the minute on the of the military, but that's unpredictable because in wars, you know, wars are. Uh, who would have believed that the Soviet Union would win in the, in the fall of 1941? I mean, very few people. So uh, it's very difficult, or, or people would have believed that France would collapse as quickly as it did in May, uh, June 1940, or, or Belgium for that matter. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's very unpredictable. Wars are unpredictable, so I don't know what's going to happen. It looks like, on the face of it, of course, it looks like the Russians are much stronger and have much more reserve. But to what extent are they willing to commit, and how many men are they going to, you know, are going to die, and so on? And then, of course, how far is NATO going to go in supporting Russia? You see, and also how long the Europeans are going to put up with that? Because for the European, it means uh, a lot of uh, a lot of well, cost. The, the the people, of then, cost. What what can you know? This is not a rhetorical question. What else can NATO, minus the United States, for a second? But European NATO countries, what can they employ? I don't see it out there. I don't see the reserves. I, I don't see the a production of this kind of military hardware. It doesn't happen in a few days or a few weeks or even a few months. It, it's, a, it takes, it's a very long, sophisticated, expensive process. Now, let's put the United States back into the game, play. Well, that's very different, okay? Um, maybe not in a conventional sense, but certainly with high technology, the US is still a fierce, fierce military power. But other than that, and that's what really worries me because if the if Ukraine isn't allowed to fall, then the United States is going to have to employ its significant muscle and the Russians will find that intolerable. And I, you both know what direction I'm going in, okay? A major clash. But I think that, but I think this is the, the, the American economy is a, it's a bloody big economy. I mean, they can produce 
the armaments. They can produce the ammunition. And there's also the whole resources of the Europe. And, you know, the, you can have factories, arms factories in Pakistan, in Morocco. You know, they can they can have them. They can, they can keep churning this stuff out, um, which means that Russia will not have achieved what he wants to achieve, which is to protect. They have to at least protect the, the territories that they that have now been incorporated into Russia. I mean, they still can't protect Donetsk City. You know, it's still being shelled. I mean, civilians are being killed, but they haven't protected it. And 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 that's what the Americans are showing. We can just keep producing this arms. We can produce the shells, and you're not able to protect your own people. Well, I mean, George, I mean, this this very famed Patriot battery that's going to be sent. Okay, I mean. The military people that I listen to that are don't go on cable TV just find this whole thing laughable. I mean, one Patriot battery, what are they going to do? Protect the presidential palace? I mean, it, it, it sounds very, very th uh, threatening and ominous, but maybe, you know, if they sent 150 or 300 batteries that would not be destroyed by Russian forces. Now, I, I you know, again, George and I, you've, you've seen the discussion George and I have had. It's also a matter of timing, George, okay? If, if um, the Russians are going to allow this to go on for years and years, then I will agree with you, okay? But that remains to be seen. No. The problem is indeed how, how, how much the United States is going to supply I mean, may, it may be that uh, some circles in the United States thinks it's time for negotiation. Huh? I mean, meaning, of course, not complete surrender of Ukraine, but some negotiation. On the other hand, indeed, negotiation may lead to a ceasefire and a demarcation zone, etc., like in Korea or in Cyprus, for that matter. Uh, you know, uh, that's uh, also a divided country. But the United States would only favor negotiations if it felt that its client was on the brink of total defeat. I think if, if it felt that Ukraine is on the brink of collapse, then I think the Americans would push for negotiation. Obviously, the Americans don't think that. I mean, I, th I think that Americans would, would make that decision if they thought that Ukraine is on the brink of collapse. So they obviously think this, they can still keep this war going and that Ukraine is not on the brink of collapse. Uh, and they think they probably don't think Russia is on the brink of collapse either. There's no indication that that's what they think. But they think Ukraine can keep going for you know months and months and months, so um, you know that I think it's an indication that the Americans don't think that how they're on they the brink do, of defeat. How do they do without energy? You see, they're lacking more. Yeah. Energy. Well, Americans have it. The, the Americans have energy. Uh, the Europeans don't. Um, well, that's, the, the Europeans that's, still have compared to Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is really sorely lacking in energy. So how do I mean I? I find that horrible. I mean, how do you do? Well, and, and on top of it, gentlemen, here, the entire electricity grid in Ukraine is Soviet slash Russian made. OK, so yeah. it's one of the things I have suggested recently is that um, when this conflict comes to an end, there's only one country that can actually re-energize Ukraine at, at, at an affordable price, and that is Russia. OK. The, the 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 everyone you keep hearing about these substations. Well, that's just part of the grid. Okay, a very important part, by the way. You destroy that small part with a precision uh, um, uh, attack, and then what you need is you need to to get the, the get that part of the grid running again. You need to get that piece. That piece isn't in Germany. It's not in France. It's not in the United States. It's in Russia right now, which can be taken put there and reconnect it. That's one of the reasons why they're doing it, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't, they, Ukraine is quickly becoming a failed state, but Russia doesn't want a failed state, whatever its borders are, on its border in the future. No, that's true. That's true. I, 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 that, I mean, but of course you say, you, you speak of the US sending weapons to Ukraine, et cetera, but I thought the point of the bombing of the, the destruction of the electricity were great was to prevent the the uh, Ukrainians from being able to bring these weapons to the front. But does that happen? I don't know. It seems but it's to be still, it's still, it's still, they are still fighting. I mean, they're still capable of fighting. I mean, the Russians haven't taken out the grid. I mean, they haven't uh, destroyed the energy grid. I mean, Ukraine is still able to mount military operations. So, yeah, so uh, that, that it still hasn't that, happened that that complete and total uh, you know well, destruction I mean, of, of, of Ukraine's what military is, what capability. Is being taken out, then what is being taken out? I read all these stories about bombings and so on. 
what is being taken out? Why is it that the train still run? And Can that's I... what, and and it, it's widely believed that that's what's, go, what's going to be next. Okay, uh, they have to stop the flow. Plus, we have this partial mobilization. Um, Douglas McGregor, very interesting person to listen to. He tends to believe that there, um, the, as part of this partial mobilization and the quote unquote future offensive is where um, Russian forces would come in through um, uh, Belarus and start cutting off these supply lines. Okay, I don't know. I'm, he's a military person. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't find the Belarus. I think Lukashenko wants to stay out of this, and I think he's going to stay out of it. Yeah. Yeah, because Belarus, if Belarus, if Russians intervene through Belarus, then it means that Belarus becomes a belligerent. It means that Belarus will have all the sanctions from the West, which they don't have. Well, well gentlemen, you, Russia, for all intents and purposes, has taken over the Belarusian military, okay, over the last few weeks. Yes, that's true, but they're still the civilian. I mean, they're still Lukashenko. I mean, whether he wants to go, I mean, the problem is that he goes to war, then his country is going to become exactly on the same stage as Russia, and you may not want that. All these know. things are unknown. There are too many unknowns. I, I just don't know. But I understand that strategically it would make sense for the Russians to invade from, from the side of Belarus. But on the other hand, the Ukrainians have been building trenches along the border, so it's not necessarily so simple. I mean, these trenches seem to be very hard to, to overcome. I mean, otherwise, why do they still fight in uh, Bakhmut? If we could go back to Europe here, you, you said it in, in a very fleeting way. Um, because of this um, ideological obsession that the elites have and their Atlanticist attachment, are, are Europeans, and I know you, you're only one person and one, you're a Frenchman, but do you think Europeans have the resolve for a very long conflict or is it they are just going to do what Washington tells them to do? Oh, the population certainly does not have a, I think in France, two thirds of the population, despite massive propaganda against that they're in favor of negoci a negotiated peace. They say, yes, we should send weapons, but we should have a negotiated peace. So I don't think the people, but uh, what is the impact? I mean, the problem is always what the impact of the populace on the politics. I mean, the politics, especially with the European construction, is totally detached from, I mean, it doesn't really matter whom you vote for, because as you say, they're actually, interchangeable. Even if you voted for the far right, suppose well, the so-called far right, uh, I don't think it would necessarily change. Meloni is in power in Italy. She's gung-ho for the Americans. She's gung-ho for Europe. She isn't going to change anything ser serious, not even on the immigration question, which is right. the only thing which has been elected for. So, right. no, I think it's right. And even Orban, I mean, Orban is a fully paid up member of the NATO and the EU. I mean, you know, he can quibble about this or that and the other, but He's ultimately dependent on money from the EU. So the EU can really put the pressure on him just saying no money for you. And that's the end of war band. So, you know, you know, there, there really isn't too much, um, uh, you know, opposition other than, you know, few far right figures who are nowhere near power. But in Italy, Italy and France are net contributors to the European budget. So they're not in the situation of Poland and uh, Hungary, but uh, so they're more independent in that sense, but in their heads, they're not at all. I mean, as I say, even the far right, and the far right is not in power yet. So um, I don't, I mean, for example, now in France, they speak of a united right. So they would unite the right with the far right and so on. But then, of course, the, the you know, the right is pro-NATO and so on. So that will be the main issue, then they will go into this business, which I don't like, about identity and Muslims and God knows what, rather than uh, the real political issues, which is, the, which is the war and the economy. That's They're not going to focus on that. They're going to give people uh, identity, but that's, that's uh, you yeah. know. But that's the interesting thing. I mean, what happened to that post, to that the left, the, the, the old left? I mean, you remember in, in Britain, you had yes. a serious left. That was it. Hated NATO. It hated the United States. Hated nuclear weapons. And yep. that was a, it. Was a serious political force. I mean, back in the late seventies, they looked like they were going to come to power. Um, it's gone. I mean, the, the, there's just no no left. The last, I mean, one, the uh, last one was Corbyn, and he was eliminated it, by exactly. You yep. know what? Or why? Yep. I mean, anti-Semitism. I mean, that yep. was a big weapon. That's also a funny thing is that this is a big weapon against the left, but the left refuses to discuss the source of this sort of. Uh, you know, a trick, because it's really a trick, this, I mean, there isn't really, at least not on people like Corbyn, there is no anti-Semitism whatsoever. 
<laughs> yeah. Not, but I mean, it, it, it's it's just very interesting these kind of campaigns that um, are so focused and and um, uh, and directed and just flood the zone, just flood the, you know, we had this with COVID, with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, obviously, um, uh, and now we're having it with, with Ukraine. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's truly terrifying uh, how few op uh, opposition dissident voices um, um, that are being heard and c shutting down um, um, media outlets um, that, that you, people disagree with. It's, it's really astounding. And at the same time, when you have um, um, living standards uh, dropping all, uh, all through the Western world. So the, the, the information sphere gets tighter and then our, our, the, the, the standard of living goes down. But there doesn't seem to be very many people saying, there, are these two related? Well, they are. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, there is no, I mean, there isn't very much thought in so-called dissident circles. There is not much uh, analysis of what's going on, so it's difficult to... to That's right, and, it's, uh, and, and anyone who is kind of a dissident has to immediately show his uh, credentials like Maloney. Hey, I'm as anti-Russian as, uh, as the next man. Don't, don't count me in the, the Putin oh. uh, lobby, you know, you know so yeah, I'm not... And, 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 I don't know, George, if you saw, but they, there's a, um, a commentator on Fox News, Mark Levine, and he has a, a program. I don't know if you saw it. It was really one of his worst. Um, but here, here's a guy that is supposed to be, um, to his very genetic code, the ultra conservative. OK, not a nationalist per se, but a conservative. And he was spouting on his program yesterday the Putin wing of the Republican Party. Yeah. Yeah, they always call it Putin as if you replace Putin by Medvedev, it would be it would be any different. I mean, it's really ridiculous. I always want to ask you, suppose you replace Putin, by whom are you going to replace him? I mean, by whom? You see, there's just nobody in Russia with more motherhood than Putin, in fact. So, I mean, in the Russian, which would be acceptable to the population. So... If Putin was going to go, that would be replaced by somebody who's more nationalist than him. Well, it's it's a it's a pity that languages um, divide people be, uh, because if you were to watch mainstream Russian media, um, they of course never directly attack pr uh, President Putin, but they certainly go after his government's policies, particularly on Ukraine. Okay, it's much more aggressive. It's more nationalistic. Um, some of these, you know, I don't, I don't want to um, use too many American examples, but they have their own versions of like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and people like uh, Mark Levine. They have some really um, um, chauvinistic voices here, but it's not coming from the government. But unfortunately, nobody in the West seems to want to pay attention. No, of course they don't. Yeah. They, they think it's all due to Putin. I mean, it's completely. It's a, I don't know Russian, but I can. I know enough to see that this is completely absurd. But that's the way. Uh, that's the way we are run. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really a very strange situation because, uh, I mean, for example, if you take the left in France, I mean, the left in France is even more for censorship. They're always for censorship. They're for cancel culture. And of course, if you say, what about uh, canceling RT? I know RT France very well because it's a friend of mine who's been, who's the director of the website. And I say, and I know very well that he, and I know many people there who are not pro Putin or not at all. And uh, they are not Russian propagandists. I'm not talking about maybe RT in Russia that I don't know, but I'm talking about RT France, and I'm talking about the the, the website. And uh, if I say what about uh, the sense, oh no 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 no, no. propagandists for Russia, you have to censor them, etc. They all accept that. There, there is no thought about free speech now. It's all fascism. You have to fight fascism. Fascism is the ultimate evil. Therefore, every means is acceptable, including like during the war, the bombing of civilian population, like in Dresden, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, it's it's almost like that. They have the same mentality that during World War II, except uh, they are against a little website. Okay, that's... that's you know, the... It's interesting you bring that up, because I, I, I find, and maybe I, I'm interested in your th thoughts, George, but the, the whole um, propaganda effort in supporting Ukraine, they're really trying to imitate a World War II yeah. Uh, a narrative, um, uh, and, and 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 it's it's not nuanced. I mean, the run up to the um, uh, first and second uh, Gulf Wars on American television, it was it was uh, there was a lot of debate. There was uh, you know, yeah. they, obviously the neocons had the upper hand, but there were still dissenting views. 
Um, now that is very, very rare, very rare. Mm. And um, and it, it it's all because, because of this um, uh, packaging of what Russia is and what Russians are and all of that. There's no nuance whatsoever. Mm. And, and 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 you know, like in Milan, they're canceling Tchaikovsky at Christmas. Well, I mean, there's nothing more Christmas than Tchaikovsky. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, yeah, and of course, the, the funny thing is that the, the people who do that are most of the time self-described anti-racist. I always find it very amusing. That it can be, you know, you say any anything about blacks or Arabs or Jews or anything like that, oh, racism is the worst evil and so on. And then when they speak no. Russian or Chinese for that matter, then it's anything goes. It's just, right. it's everything is absurd. I mean, I don't know what happened to the West. I mean, there's been total destruction of fashion. But then the, the question arises then, is this, this propaganda mobilization, is this in preparation for war? This is just simply let's just keep this going and, and then it'll dissolve. Or is this a preparation? You know, you're getting the population, hey, you've got to, really got to hate these people. These are evil KGB communists, Nazis, you know, anti-Semites, everything, anti-vaxxer, whatever it is. Putin is that. So is this is what do you think that it's a it's a way of mobilizing essentially the, the Western population for war? Well, I don't think it works very well in the sense that the population, as I said, in France, which is very much indoctrinated, isn't following that script. But uh, uh, of course, among the elites, you don't know. But then, of course, you have also to ask yourself, what does the military think? I mean, I hope the. I mean, I, I've been saying for many, many years that the only peace movement left is the U.S. military. I mean, it's not completely true, but there is a reluctance to go to war among certain parts of the military. Only certain amount. You know, you got people like Ben Hodges, who used to be one of the top. NATO people, the guy's guy's off his rocker. I mean, you know, he's so filled with hatred for the Russian. You can you can for yeah, every sensible general, you can pick three American generals who are absolutely nuts on the subject of Russia. Mike, Mike, love is Mike, still Mike, 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 love, exactly. That's another one. Yeah, Mike Miller is different. Um, yes, it it seems like it. Yeah, uh, you know, but I, I don't know about Milley. Milley seems like a you know uh, you know he he he's a, a, a political opportunist. I wouldn't I wouldn't count yeah. on Milley. I, I, I think I think Milley's currency in the elite is 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 basically worthless right now. Okay, yeah. so I wouldn't really count on what he has to say. But uh, just remember, gentlemen, he oversaw the um, the, the withdrawal from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Okay, I don't think he's got a lot of street credibility right now. Yeah, and if, when you remember what he was talking about, white nationalism, white rage. Anyone who's talking about white rage, um, yeah. you know that that's that's he's, that's not good news. <laughs> And, and and what saved Milley, the reason why he still has his job is that he came, openly came out against Trump. So he got a free to pass. He got a pass. Yeah. You know, he, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He doesn't say the right things all the time, but he's anti-Trump. He's he's on our side then. That's very tribal. Yeah, it's very tribal, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's like it. Let's yes. <laughs> Well, Jean, I mean, this has Happy been a really <laughs> this has been a really interesting discussion. So, thank you once again for giving us your time. You know, we covered a lot of ground. And it's been a fascinating uh, debate, and so um, hope you will join us again very soon. And so, thank you. And remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.